quantum mechanics has a small set of ground rules called the postulates. Why did I make an entire video about this and why does this matter? Well, maybe one of the most difficult aspects of quantum mechanics is that it's so confusing. Um, it has so many effects and so many rules. You know, there's a wave function and a tunnel effect and a wave particle duality and an uncertainty principle and so on and so on and so on. And the danger with that is that this may seem like a long laundry list of things, of weird things, and not really a coherent structure. And I think that's why almost no layman have a good grasp of quantum theory. They just have a collection of things they have heard, but no structure between those. I will try to give you this structure here. And this structure is the postulates of quantum mechanics. What is a postulate? A postulate is a state or a fragment that is assumed to be true. Basically, we have observed this and checked this and it appears to hold. And we cannot deduce it from anything else. Quite the opposite, actually. Everything else rests on it. So it's kind of a basic framework for the entire theory. Most physical theories have something like that, like uh, Newton's laws of mechanics, sometimes also called axioms, or the laws of thermodynamics. The difference with quantum mechanics is there does not seem to be any real agreement as to what exactly should be a postulate and how many there should be and how they should be numbered. So I've seen anything from between four and nine. And actually some textbooks don't even use the term postulate at all. I will be going with four postulates describing the basics of quantum theory. State of a system, time evolution, physical quantities, and measurement. A system is just a part of the universe that we're interested in. This could be the interior of a laser, or the atoms captured in an iron trap, or the Earth's atmosphere, or the inside of a star, whatever. How do we describe this system? Classically, if we know the position and momenta of all the components making up the system at a given time, so if we know where everything is and how it is moving, we know everything about the system. Quantum mechanical systems are described by their wave function or state vector, written like this for a single particle. This is the Dirac notation, basically a different notation for a vector, and we call this a cat. Each state that a system could be in, for example, each possible energy it can have, is represented by one of those cats. So, if an atom has a particular energy, it is in the corresponding quantum state. And all cats together form the state space of the system, which mathematically is a Hilbert space. But the fact that every state is a vector in a vector space implies a very important consequence. If you have several possible states, then any combination of those states will also be a viable state of the system. We call this a superposition. In simple words, a system can be in a combination of states instead of just one. And this is what people mean when they say an atom can be in two places at once. But we'll get back to what it really means later. For now, let's summarize. The state of a quantum system is defined by its state vector or wave function, which can also be a superposition of multiple states. This vector belongs to a Hilbert space, a space containing all possible states. At any given time, the wave function holds all the information about the state the system is in currently. But this is just for one point in time, and things tend to change. In physics, we call this time evolution. To calculate time evolution, we need something where we can input the current state of the system, and it will output how the state of the system will change over time. In classical physics, this is given by Newton's laws, or by the hamilton jacobi equations. In quantum mechanics, we have the Schrödinger equation for that. 
the Schrödinger equation is what mathematicians call a first order differential equation. This means that if you have one initial information about the state, the initial wave function, you can calculate how the wave function evolves and what it does over time. The H in the Schrödinger equation is the Hamiltonian, which describes the dynamics of the system, how the different parts interact with each other. We can also use the Hamiltonian to calculate time evolution for classical systems. So finding the Hamiltonian again here isn't a huge surprise exactly. In the simplest case, it looks like this, where the first term gives the kinetic energy and the second term the potential energy. Or this is the Hamiltonian of the Ising model, which describes magnetism in solids. And this is the Hamiltonian for a qubit in a superconducting quantum computer. So, time evolution is given by the Schrödinger equation. When we know the current state of a system and the dynamics of the system given by its Hamiltonian, we can use the Schrödinger equation to calculate any future state of the system. Up until now, we've only been talking about the wave function, which is a mathematical object, and very little about physics. Every physical property that we can measure is called an observable, because, well, we can observe it. In quantum theory, every observable is represented by a linear operator acting on a wave function, which will change it in some way. The connection between these operators and our measurements is that the only possible measurement outcomes we can get are the eigenvalues of these operators. What are eigenvalues? There are specific states that are unchanged by an operator, so the operator acting on them just reproduces the same state, just with a numerical factor. These states are the eigenstates of the operator, and those numerical values are its eigenvalues, the possible measurement results for this observable. Some observables can take on any value, for example position in most cases. But there are other observables that can only take on a limited set of discrete values, like the possible energies of an atom. The operator for the total energy of a system is the Hamiltonian, which we already know from the Schrödinger equation. The Hamiltonian has a sort of double role. It defines how a system evolves over time. Also, it is the total energy operator, so the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian are the possible energy states of the system. So in summary, the third postulate. Any physical property that can be measured is represented by an operator. The only possible measurement results are the eigenvalues of this operator. Measurement has a very special role in quantum mechanics. It's the only place where the quantum world interacts with our normal macroscopic world. It's also the only case where a system can change in a way not described by the Schrödinger equation. Let's consider a system in a superposition of states and measure it. When an observable is measured, you get one of the possible eigenvalues, but in a completely random fashion. Also, the wave function immediately changes to the eigenstate corresponding to the measured result. We call this the collapse of the wave function. Again, this is random. We cannot calculate which eigenvalue we will measure. All we can do is calculate the probability for every possible outcome by projecting the wave function onto the respective eigenstate. As for the claim that quantum objects can be in two states at once, well, in a way, we can only ever measure one state but as long as we don't measure, the system can be in a superposition of many states. Yes. So immediately after we've measured the result, we know that the system is in the eigenstate corresponding with this result. However, it's wrong to assume that the system had already been in the state before the measurement, as um, Bell's inequality and uh, Bell experiments show. It's important to note that measurements always have this destructive tendency in quantum theory. You just cannot measure a quantum system without irrevocably disturbing it and changing it. When we perform a measurement of a quantum state, the result will be an eigenvalue of the observable. 
This will be a random choice from all possible results and the probability for each result is given by the wave function. The measurement causes the wave function to collapse into the eigenstate corresponding to the measured eigenvalue. Alright, of course there's more to quantum mechanics than this, but these are the basic rules. These postulates define the framework of the entire theory. It is remarkable that quantum mechanics is so different from other physical theories like mechanics or electrodynamics. It is both a theory about physics, about the behavior of systems, which is described by the Hamiltonian. But it is also a kind of meta-theory about information, about what we can know about systems and how we can find out. People often complain that quantum mechanics is just a set of mathematical rules and it is very difficult to construct a compelling narrative out of those. And, and this is why people often say we don't really understand quantum mechanics. We simply don't have a simple picture for what's really going on. We only have those weird rules about waves of probability and random outcomes. Especially measurement is a problem. There are diverging opinions of how it should be interpreted and there is still no detailed description of the measurement process or even a strict definition of what measurement even means. Which is why we speak about the measurement problem of quantum mechanics. The early inventors of quantum theory had very intense discussions and arguments about the philosophy and the meaning behind the math. But this was in the 1920s and 1930s and it has pretty much stopped completely after that. Anyway, I think it might be helpful to make another video about how these rules are applied to a concrete example. So if you're interested in that, let me know. I'm Chris and this is Physics But Awesome. If you like this video, subscribe for more.